Okay, well, we're having a few um, leaflets and pamphlets being handed out to the audience, so that looks uh, like an, an extra bonus for this particular session. So, welcome to uh, the second last uh, presentation for Who Do You Think You Are 2015. Again, a big thank you to Family Tree DNA for sponsoring this uh, DNA workshop, and to ISOG, uh, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, for organizing the lectures. And it gives me great pleasure to uh, present to you Geraldine Charles and Val May Young. Now, um, Ger although uh, an archivist for many years with the National Maritime Museum, Geraldine Charles originally studied biological sciences to degree level, and this included anthropology and genetics. Geraldine is also a founder member of the Families of British India Society and has given many talks that include the use of DNA in British India family history. Balme is webmaster and trustee of FIBIS, Families in British India Society. And Balme also works at Suffolk Record Office and started the FIBIS DNA project in 2012 after realizing its potential in breaking down the all too common brick walls in British India research due to the lack of documentary evidence. So today, uh, Geraldine and Valme are going to be a tag team and they're going to talk about the genetic legacy of British India. Ladies and gentlemen, Geraldine Jail, James and Valme Young. Um, actually, Geraldine James is a famous actress. <laughs> but she has the India connection with Jewel in the Crown. Well, first of all, the genetic legacy of British India, well, it is a number of us. And you'll see on that image a group of people in red shirts. And they are all part of the genetic legacy of British India. Because we all carry, at some point, either within our DNA, at least some of the chromosomes or mitochondria, which come down through the Indian subcontinent. Now let me introduce you to my family. That's my mum and my aunt Lorna. That's my grandmother Daisy Bradbury, uh, Fortney Johnson, and my grandfather Bertie Bradbury. Down there is my dad, Ken Charles, his mother, Aileen Ellis, and his father, George Charles. Now, my grandfather used to say he and his siblings were like the keys of the piano. They were both black and white. So I'm going to talk to you about a group of people called the Anglo-Indians. There are many definitions, you'll get one definition. If you want to invite me for coffee afterwards, we can discuss who are Anglo-Indians. So, mum's family. Now I want you to look at their faces. There's my granddad, Bertie. There he is as a little boy. And that's his mum, and that's his aunt. And as someone once said to me, that is not a European countenance. So already in the photographic records that I inherited, there is indications that there might be something other than European ancestry. Over there is my, this is my grandmother, that's her father, Robert Johnson. Her mother, Susan Harvey. And this lady there, I want you to remember, 
That is Anne Edwina Oliver, who married William Harvey. Remember Anne. So there's mum, there's my aunt, there's my grandmother, her parents, and her, her mother's mother. Over here, my granddad, his father, his mother, and his aunt. This is dad's family. This is George Charles, they're all called George, who came out from England. But look, this is who he married. Does she look particularly English? Probably not. But her surname is Lyons, and that is her brother in the background. This is my granddad, and there's him as a grown man. That's my dad, and my other grandmother. All the names you see, Charles, Lyons, Ellis, Jones, they're all English. Now I'm going to give you one definition of who the Anglo-Indians are. An Anglo-Indian is a person of mixed Asiatic and non-Asiatic descent, whose father, grandfather, or remote ancestors in the male line was born on the continent of Europe, or in Canada, or Newfoundland, Australia, New Zealand, the Union of South Africa, or the United States of America in the male line. So it's not just European, it's not just Anglo meaning British. Anglo covers all of that. So we start with our paper records, the hatches, matches and dispatches of the India office, which is in London, British Library, which we've got Find My Past, you can have access to the records as well. So India divided at that time the subcontinent into the Bengal Presidency, the Madras Presidency and the Bombay Presidency. Pakistan would come over here eventually. You have what would become Burma and what would become East Pakistan and then Bangladesh. The records for the Bengal Presidency, 1713 to 1948. For Madras, 1698 to 1948. For Bombay, 1709 to 1948. And the records are baptisms, marriages, and burials. Uh, as I say, you can look at these records and find my past, but another uh, particular website you might find useful if you're doing India is Family Search. So where did the Anglo-Indians come from? John Company is another name for the East India Company. And in 1687, the East India Company decided to promote Christian marriages between their men and the Indian women of Fort St. George, which is the capital, if you like, of the Madras Presidency. Because as the Portuguese left India, their descendants, who we call the Luso Indians, Luso coming from an old name for Portugal, were coming into the British areas, bringing with them the priests, the Roman Catholic religion, their wives and their daughters. And the British men were forming liaisons, marriages, within the Catholic religion, and their children were being brought up as Catholics. So the Church of England was worried about this, the East India Company was. And so, in 1687, they decided to promote the marriages by paying a golden coin to the woman, to the mother, at the time of the baptism of each child born within such a marriage. And you can find that if you want to in this particular record in the India office. Later, you get a five rupees a month allowance being paid to the soldiers in the rank for the support of each child. And in Lambeth Palace, you can actually see the correspondence where they are worried, the Church of England, about the fact that children are being brought up as Catholics and actually send teachers out there as well as people to teach them the correct religion that they thought that they should adhere to. So, why are they marrying Indian women? Well, before 1833, for a woman to go out to India, she had to have permission from the East India Company. She had to be able to pay to go out there. She had to support herself out there. So the men who were being based out there, whether they're in the East India Company's armies or civil service, they were looking within India to get their wives. And according to um, Air Chatterton, in around 1800 in the Bengal Presidency, one in 20 Englishmen were married to an English woman. So that's how many women were in marriages 
with East India Company men who were not actually English. So basically I'm saying there is no large pool of marriageable British women in India from which the lower echelons, the East India Company men, could choose wives. So they entered into long-term relationships with country-born women. They could be East Indians, like my ancestresses, who were of British Indian descent. Russo-Indians, I use that term because it's more exotic than Portuguese, but they were of the Portuguese Indian descent. They would tend to be Catholic. Or they could be Indian women. And before the marriage, an Indian woman would have to have changed her religion for her to be married in a church by bands. So, so all of you know that you inherit from your mother and father 23 chromosomes, 22 autosomes plus an X chromosome from your mother, 22 autosomes plus a Y or an X chromosome from your father. And you'll notice the uh, female things sort of pink and male things sort of blue on there. Now, as you probably know, from your mother only, you will get mitochondria. And the mitochondria sit in the cytoplasm of the egg. They do not sit in the nucleus where the chromosomes are. And so in the chromosome of a fertilized egg, you get the 23 chromosomes from the mother, the 23 from the father. But you also have your mitochondria, which you have got from your mother. And the mitochondria are important because go back to the time of evolution to the first cells being formed and you get the mitochondria were actually free living organisms with a single ring of DNA eventually during the course of evolution some of them got absorbed into what we call the eukaryotic cells and that is why they have their own DNA because their ancestors were free living organisms with a circular piece of DNA so as I say this is a rather strange diagram. Here is mitochondria coming down the female line and it ends with a man. And so that mitochondria is not going to go any further because men can't pass mitochondria on, only women can. And there's the man down there, so he's coming down there, he's got his mother's mitochondria. This chap's got his mother's mitochondria and this man down here has got her mitochondria. And there the line will end. So, mitochondrial Eve. We all know who mitochondrial Eve is, don't we? Some of you will have seen the film about Stephen Hawking and his concept of the Big Bang, that everything in the universe goes back to one common singularity. And mitochondrial Eve is the one common singularity that all living populations in terms of mitochondrial DNA go backwards to all the groups come backwards and backwards and then there's Eve and then there's Eve's mother and then probably her grandmother back in time but Eve is the first one who has the common DNA to all living people so as I said mitochondrial Eve the most recent common ancestor of all currently living humans she was not the only living female of her day she would have had sisters aunts but her sisters, they did not give rise to this line of DNA that comes from the mitochondria. Her descendants would still be around, just as the descendants of Eve's brothers would be around if they had children. We're not saying they didn't survive, we're just saying in the DNA terms, only Eve herself passed the mitochondria down. Now, this was one of the first books ever to be written on this subject, and I can recommend you reading it because of the way it's written and the idea that there were firstly the seven daughters of Eve. There are more now, from what I gather, including mine who's named M, and Valmais who's named HB. But those seven daughters actually got quite nice names. So do go away, look at the book, you get it off Amazon, you get it second hand. As I say, none of her female contemporaries gave rise to the direct unbroken female line today. And the only other person who'd be sharing her DNA, apart from any sisters or aunts she might have had, would be her mother. And there we go. Estimated Eve would have been around 
190,000 to 200,000 years ago. Now, Eve, that is where your family tree is going to begin, with Eve. So you, you have to get used to the jargon. I've tried to explain it. I've called the human time machine. So we think of living people forming genetic populations or haplogroups. And a genetic population, they share a common ancestor, whether it's a patrilineal or matrilineal line. And we use the DNA to track each haplogroup, each population back. And as we journey back through time, the haplogroups begin to come together until we come back to the common ancestor, the singularity that is mitochondrial Eve. And if I can interpret this correctly, there's Eve, and L3 is, I think, from where I come, and I come off going down this way to M, and I think Valme comes up this way, and ends up somewhere here, because she's HV. So each of you, depending on what your DNA analysis would show, you'll be somewhere there. So this is my HAPO group, M. And so that's mitochondrial DNA. And it actually includes South Asia, East Asia, and Australasia. So when my results came back, my mitochondrial DNA is Indian, not European at all. And HAPO group M, approximately 70,000 years ago. But M has got a name, Malakshmi. So on my tree, I have got Eve at the top, then I've got L3, and then I've got Malakshmi. And then there's a huge gap till we start with paper records. Um, for Valme, HB is the ancestress of two groups, one called Helena and one called Velda. So they get nice names. So I'm going to use Malakshmi. Now, I have, during the course of my life, been able to study different disciplines. And uh, to me, there is a wheel of life. Now, if you all put yourself, I, where I say me. So we have our family life here. We move out, and then we have family history or genealogy around us. Then we move into histo the historical past. Then we move into the archeological past and then into the realms of anthropology, where Darwin said the cradle of mankind will be Africa. Louis Leakey and Mary Leakey proved the cradle of mankind to be, would be in Africa. Then outside of that, we move into evolutionary time, to paleontology, to before the primates existed, before the human species existed, and we go back and back until we get to the ancestors of the mitochondria, and before that, we go to the origin of the Earth itself. And from then, we leap into cosmology. And then back to the singularity that Stephen Hawking came up with, the Big Bang. All of this is part of your story. And we shouldn't just be interested in family history. Let us find out the historical past for our ancestors that we start to find by looking at what the DNA is telling us. Let us go back to anthropology to find out how they lived. Look at the, the pictures that cro Manion man did, or Neanderthal man when he was burying flowers with the dead. The sort of feelings they had, what their culture was like. Start to try and understand that because that was all part of your history as well. So there's my family tree quickly. Eve's mother, Eve, L3, and all of you. M group, but actually, and all the rest. I'm currently awaiting to get my full M mitochondria result. I'm hoping to make a quantum leap from the paper records of my last known ancestors into the DNA results that have come from the, what has been done in India. And maybe in one of the subgroups of the M Malachmi group, I'll be able to find what caste my ancestresses were in, or at least what part of India and I will be able to then go into what is known in terms of history and anthropology and add more to what I understand about how I came to be born in Bangalore and why today I'm standing here trying to enthuse you all to join me in finding out about history and anthropology. So let us make the jump 
This is the furthest back I go. Katharina Williams, born circa 1785 and married William. Their daughter Lucy, born about 1800, married Thomas Oliver. Then if you remember Anne, in the centre of the photograph, there's Anne. Now she had a sister called Frances, so the mitochondria coming from Catherine to Lucy, to Anne, but also to Frances. And because I've traced in paper records what's happening with Frances, I know there's a descendant line through her, so the mitochondria going through her. Then from Anne, we go up there to my great-grandmother, Susan. Now Susan had two daughters who lived, my grandmother Daisy, but also Sybil. Sybil's got a descendant line, she had daughters, so the mitochondria from Katharina are going down this way. There's my mum and there's me. Okay, I'm the end of the line there, but my mum's sister has the same mitochondria as Katharina. She's got two daughters, my cousin Susie and Julia, and my cousin Ian. Susie and Julia have got descendant lives. The mitochondria from Katharina are still passing on today. So what other mitochondrial DNA might I be able to use to find out about my own family? So I'm now playing detective. There's dad and there's his mum. Dad's dead, his mum is dead. Dun Nanny, but I won't go to why she's called Dun Nanny. Dad had two brothers, they're both dead. But I'm alive, and if you go up there, there's Dun Nanny, and she had a sister. Now her sister had a daughter who's still living. Now if my dad's cousin has the mitochondrial DNA done, it will tell me what my dad's mitochondrial DNA was. Because they both descend from my great-grandmother. So you can do creative genealogy. And then there's my grandfather, George Charles. There's me, dad's dead, he's dead, his sister's dead, but his sister's got living children in Australia. Now if they have their DNA, mitochondrial DNA looked at, it will tell me what my grandfather's was, and it will then tell me about my great-grandmother because she would be passing mitochondria down. So you can start to do a bit of creative genealogy with the paper records. So there's my mum and my dad. When I got my family finder results, that's what was intriguing. 54% was showing as European, but look how much Asian DNA I'm showing. And that's what I've received from the autosomal DNAs, the chromosomes, that I inherited from both of them. And that is was quite a higher proportion than I thought would be Asian. Or if you look at it down this way, there is 49% um, is British, 5% European, and the rest is South Asian, and East Asian, and Central Asian. That to me was a surprise. Um, but there again, you've got, this is the autosomal DNA coming down, there's mum, there's dad, and there are my grandparents and my great-grandparents, and there's me being a man, apparently. So we could, you, when you have your family finder done, you will get a map. Well, this is how my spread was. There I am over there, but here I am in India, out here in East Asia, but weirdly down in Madagascar. I still do not understand why I'm showing up from Madagascar, but there you go. But very much more than I expected showing up for India over here because from what I understand, Family Finder is five generations and for it to be that much showing in me, which has already been divided in half with, with dad and mum, seemed quite high to me. Right, we're now going to talk about men, the Y chromosome. Now, as I've mentioned how the Anglo-Indians came into being, Generally, Anglo-Indians are going to be of European descent in the father's line, and that will tend to be reflected in the surname. You would expect Indian or Y chromosomal DNA to be very rare, if at all, present in Anglo-Indians. In fact, before independence, marriages between Indian men and European or Anglo-Indian women was rare, but not unknown, because I used to have someone in the family called, known as Auntie Trixie. Auntie Trixie was Beatrix Upshon. She married an Indian gentleman whose surname was Lazarus, and she became Upshon Lazarus. 
So I know that some Anglo-Indian women certainly did marry Indian men. So when we are looking for our ancestry in India, the further back we go, we might hit a, what we would call a brick wall. It can be due to the lack of records being sent to UK. Either the priest didn't do it, or it could be Catholic records because they didn't have to send them back. Could be you've got an Indian ancestress who was baptized prior to marriage. She's taken a European name, but she took a European surname as well. She now becomes masked within the records. And what I'd like to just finish with for this point, there is Susan Harvey. I've already told you she gets her mitochondrial M group DNA from her mother, Anne. But through her father, the paper records show she descends from William Harvey, her father, from her great grandparents, Robert Harvey and Mutamar, who became known as Sarah. And Mutamar married by bands in Fort St. George and Cuddalore. To be married by bands, she had to be a Christian. When her first child was born, her mother, the mother's name is Mutama Harvey. It is not until the second child comes along that the name Sarah appears. And this goes back to something that was happening in India where General Cornwallis started to exclude the men who, or boys who were going to go to the civil service, going to go to the armies, who couldn't prove both parents to be European. So they were not obviously going to go around and look at every single person and see what colour they were. But in terms of paper records, if your mother's Sarah Harvey, European. Mutama Harvey, a bit more suspect. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Valme. Hello. Um, I started the DNA project in 2012 after using it uh, to help my father's family. Uh, it was adopted by his stepfather. And the people standing at and they suspect, uh, they suspect they have an Indian ancestor, but it's hard to prove because they can't find any documents and evidence. And um, when I was doing my father's research, I thought, well, this is this could help with the ripples people are having with their Indian research. Um, because usually also it's the, the woman that's Indian um, and it's not very well doc documented at all. So we started the project. And it has had quite a few success um, success stories. Um, you have to excuse me, I've lost the vision in my right eye. Um, let's see, where are we up to? Yeah, I think I've covered all that, haven't I? <coughs> Sorry. You don't have to be a fitness member. Um, to take part in the project at all. It's open to non fitness members as well. Um, if you've been tested by Ancestry, there are some tests that uh, can be transferred over to join our project. Um, it's the Y DNA results that can be transferred over. Uh, I think we've handed out some flyers with details of our project. Um, so far, as far as my DNA tests, we've had uh, we've got 14 uh, members that have tested for my DNA, and 13 of those 14 are confirmed Asian haplogroups. Only two of the men have European surnames. Um, it could be there could be several several reasons. Um, That's it. In, 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 in. The different suggestions are you could have someone who is an Indian Christian who's adopted a surname, a European surname. So when their DNA is tested, it will start to show Indian combinations because the ancestor is actually Indian, whereas it's masked by the surname. You can get anglicised names. For example, I know of someone whose family are called Todman. But originally they were Parsis, so they were Todawans. So again, the name has been changed. Uh, I've come up with the suggestion maybe somehow there's an influence from the Indo Greeks because the Alexander the Great tried to conquer the north of India, and later there was a dynasty of Indo Greeks up there. Maybe some of their descendants have taken Greek names but were actually 
sort of Indian. Um, the other thing which came up today is, of course, Armenians. There could be someone who has Armenian ancestry and again has anglicized their name. And in modern Greeks as well who went out to India, you can get Greek names obviously being changed into British names and you might suddenly find you've got sort of Greek ancestry showing up. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand back again to Valmy, who's going to t tell you something about what happened with her DNA. I was originally going to talk to you about the family finder test. Um, because I've, uh, I had my grandmother done a few years ago and my uncle, her son, done the following year, but I hadn't really had time to look into it. So when Debbie asked if I'd give a talk, I thought, I'll do it to Geraldine, I'll do the ultrasound one bit, the um, family find bit, she'll do the, the others. But a few weeks ago when I started to put the talk together, I noticed, because I'd never looked at them in depth before, when I had my grandma done, I'd looked at her results, and I saw, oh yeah, Central Asian DNA. Um, and when I had my uncle done the following, uh, the following year, um, I saw he had Central Asian DNA, and that he was, my grandma did show his mother, which was a relief, because you don't want to tell a 90-year-old that she'd taken the wrong baby home from the hospital. Um, but when I, I was putting the talk together, I noticed my uncle had more Central Asian DNA than his mother and my my grandfather was English and I couldn't figure out how he got this extra eight Central Asian DNA and um, I thought oh great my talk's now gone to pot now what am I going to do um, I went to bed I couldn't sleep and I know this sounds corny but I even dreamt about the problem and in my dream I remembered my granddad telling me that he had um, his mother had Romani ancestors when I woke up in the morning, I suddenly remembered my dream and I thought, I wonder if that really is where the Indian DNA came from. And sure enough, that's where it did come from. Um, I had never been able to research his, uh, his mother's father. Um, I haven't found birth for him or anything. And I've, I logged into Family Tree and DNA to look at the closest matches for my uncle. And the three closest matches, which were his second cousins, uh, were um, Romneys, Romney Gypsies. So, just if you do have your family find a test done and you, it shows that you have Central Asian DNA in your results, um, don't assume that you do have an Indian in the last 25 generations. It could also be a, a Romney Gypsy. Um, so, I've still got a lot of research to do in that line, but I thought it's still worth a mention. <laughs> On to FTDNA, you will find something called the Genographic Project. According to the site, it tells us you can discover migration paths of your ancient ancestors. Learn what percentage of your genome is affiliated with specific regions of the world, yes. Discover if you have Neanderthal or Denisovan ancestry, and I have yet to find out what that means, but I'll look it up. But I must tell you about this. If you've got a computer, go on to YouTube. Look for a program called The Journey of Man, A Genetic Odyssey. And it's by Spencer Wells. And that is a fantastic program to get you hooked onto going back in time to finding out about the pathways and the migrations that your ancestors took. You can also go onto Amazon and try and find Spencer Wells' book. I had to go all the way to Canterbury to get it because I had to write um, a bit about it within two days and that was a journey and a half like a migration, I can tell you, with on a Sunday trying to get out to Canterbury from Deptford. There, there is very likely there the um, YouTube uh, link, but Journey of Man, The Genetic Odyssey, Spencer Wells should get you there. So, we are lines, lines through history, lines through paleontology, lines through cosmology, lines follow us wherever we go. We might be the end of a line, we might be the beginning of something else. When I was in Australia, I went to Ayers Rock, Uluru, and I went around there, and it's a very sacred site, and I saw the pictures, and the Aboriginals 
have stories called song lines, and the song lines are for different reasons. So there'd be song lines to do with finding water, song lines about the ancestors, about their origins. And I was in a group called Song Lines, and we did a sort of a creative workshop, and I created something that I would like to share with you. This is a song line, and I would like each of you to take away either the song or the words or just the thought. I am the thread, I am the line, I am the story written through time. I am the song my ancestors sang. I am the new path. We are the line. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay, well, are there any questions for Valmy and Geraldine? I have a question over here. There was talk about Central Asian as opposed to East Asian, and you said Romani is included in that. What else is included in that sort of Central Asian area? Well, I think it's uh, important to take all of these biogeographical analyses uh, with a little bit of a pinch of salt, because the, the, the results that you're getting is, first of all, an estimate, so on either side of any estimate, there's going to be a range, number one. Number two, all of these uh, estimates are based on a reference population, and the, the quality of the estimate that you get is only as good as the reference population. So, for example, um, I think Family Tree DNA have a fairly good reference population, but there are different uh, companies like National Geographic, for example, which is sampling all around the world, 200 different ethnic groups which ultimately will have a much more refined and specific uh, reference population to which you can compare your uh, DNA to see exactly how your own biogeographical analysis and ethnic admixture measures up. So I think in Central Asia, do you know, Debbie, offhand, uh, what's included in Central Asia? I mean, to me, it's a blob in the middle hanging over India, so um, it's difficult to know. Valme. The Romanis originated originally in India and with them intermarrying within their own community, the help of group has remained and of course it's not migrated out. So it's still Central Asia. Does it include a lot of the countries uh, bordering on India like Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, that type of thing? Central Asia does. This this the Central Asia. There, um, my uncles did actually show up West Asian and other ones as well, but I haven't had time to research into it. It just blew me, and then with my eye problem, I haven't really had <laughs> Fine. Okay, question from Debbie. I was just going to make an observation. I just wondered, have you thought of trying to do a Y-DNA test on someone to try and determine the source of that um, Romany? My understanding is that I think it's something like 25% of Romanys come out with um, Hapa Group H, which is the, one of the Indian Hapa Groups, but a lot of them do actually come out with R&B, which is a traditional uh, European Hapa Group. I, I'm not in touch with any of the Beckwiths, uh, the descendants of, of that, that line. Um, we've lost touch, but I haven't really had time to try and track them down yet, but I will be working on tracking them down <laughs> as I get my eye fixed and everything else. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? How many people do you actually have in the uh, Families in British India Society project at this point in time? 98 so far. And you have 14 who have done Y-DNA testing. The others are autosomal DNA testing or mitochondrial or a mix? Majority are also more and uh, the, uh, the rest are mitochondrial. I can't remember the exact, exact figures. And, and are you finding that the people who have uh, contributed autosomal DNA, they're actually getting matches on the autosomal DNA to each other and they're finding second, third and fourth cousins in there? Yes, we've got several connections. I'm, with my own uh, research as well, I've found cousins um, from my grandma uh, from India that have ended up in Australia. Um, how big do you think the, the project is going to grow in the end? Um, well, it's grown pretty fast. We only started a couple of years ago and uh, I'm a I think we've got several more people signing up today to get an offer on. 
Okay, we have a question here at the back. You said that the line tests had ancestry put into your project, but people today have told me that ancestry aren't yet putting out their line test results to go into other uh, databases. How, how does that work? Well, An Ancestry have actually suspended their Y-DNA test and there was a, a time when you were in a position to transfer it. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can still transfer it. There is a link on the Family Tree DNA website. If you've done an Ancestry Y-DNA test, they've removed the database, but you, you should still have access to the results and somewhere on, in the Learning Centre there's a, a link where you can actually do what's called a Y-DNA transfer. You do have to pay. I can't You can't just type numbers in from a printed report, you have to get it actually out of Ancestry. I believe so. You, you can, if you've got the printed report, you can enter those numbers manually. Yeah. Where is autosomal come from? I, mean, we just, we, I didn't think I, I didn't understand that. Yeah. We talked about Y DNA, we talked about mitochondrial DNA. What's autosomal DNA? Well, if you remember, I talked about when mum and dad. And I showed you that. And I said earlier on, you get 23 chromosomes from your mother, 23 from your father. One chromosome is going to be in an X from your mother. One is going to, for you, would have been an X from your father. That means 22 chromosomes which are autosomal from your mother, 22 chromosomes which are autosomal from your father. They sit in the center of the fertilized egg around the fertilized egg of the mitochondria. That's why you get them from the mother, because they are in the egg before fertilization. The autosomal uh, chromosomes, you have the 23 already in the egg from your mum, and then the sperm comes in and goes like that, and it injects the other 23 in, and there's your 46 autosomes. Any further questions? We have one here. Do autosomal DNA results looking like in the Fibus project? Are you finding most of your project members do come up with a certain percentage of um, Asian DNA, one source or another? No. <laughs> okay. yeah, um, there are quite a few, but there, I think there's probably more that don't show Indian uh, and, and the trace of uh, Indian DNA than um, those that uh, do. <laughs> Um, yeah, yes, but it's not, um, I'll, I'll have some of that Romani and I've got some of the, the um, Indian. Um. Did you not see my map? <laughs> right, because um, I think off the top of my head it's 53% is, is European and British, the other is Central. South and East uh, Asia, plus Madagascar. The, the, the Madagascar connection is quite interesting. Now, are there known migrations from India down to Madagascar? Um, I think you'd have to watch the program and see where the land bridges and things were. I'm thinking. Because when you get the migrations um, along the coastlines, the coastlines have ceased to exist. So any archaeological remains would have gone. What I don't know, but if you go back and watch the program, they might say whether the, the branch of M group is coming that way, that way. So it's probably going to be more to do with that. That if the Madagascar line goes back, it probably meets up with another one. That well, would be and my of course, guess. it might be quite recent as well because a lot of Indians came down the east coast of Africa. So Kenya has a very large yeah, Indian that's population. Kind of that's more much more recent. Century. But. Of course, what we're looking at here is samples that are taken yes. in the but 21st I century. So. I wouldn't have thought it's relevant in my family. It would be relevant to, be to right. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, it was more than yeah. I expected. 
Oh, it could be we were very interested in lemurs and we went to got some lemurs and someone got married out there. Question here? It's just, just really a point that on that on the Madagascar question, Madagascar was only inhabited from Southeast Asia in about a thousand AD, or, or sorry, around about the year north. It wasn't in, it wasn't inhabited from Africa. It all came from Southeast Asia. So presumably, some of the um, DNA was from there. With the East India Company, people stopping off on Madagascar when they're coming. There's round. that as well. They could have been coming this way. There could be all sorts of reasons right. why Madagascar showing up, and we could. Yeah. Discuss all sorts of things over coffee yeah, if you're buying. But certainly the whole the whole population, the original population of Madagascar came from Southeast Asia. But are you sure about that? Well they all I speak tell you Southeast why, Asian because languages. The fossil lemurs show that the connection is with Africa. And if you look at Ad Adaphis, which is one of the fossil lemurs. The lemurs were 85 million years ago, the human population was 2,000 years ago. But well, these are special lemurs that had canoes. Okay. Well, it just gets more interesting and more interesting. Oh, well, we can make up anything you want. Great. Well, um, thank you both very much for a fascinating presentation. And please, ladies and gentlemen, can we show our appreciation to Geraldine Charles and Val Thank you very much. Fabulous.